On 17 January 1983, Nigeria's President Shehu Shagari issued an executive order that expelled 2 million undocumented West African migrants. About 1 million of these migrants were from Ghana. These migrants had been attracted to Nigeria because of the 1970s oil boom, but by 1983, Nigeria's economy had weakened and it was also an election year in that country. The Nigerian politicians hoped that the expulsion of these migrants would prove popular. Across Nigeria, up to 2 million migrants heard the warnings of arrest, prosecution, and forced deportation if they did not comply with the executive order. This policy by President Shehu Shagari would strain relationships between Nigeria and Ghana, and it took years for mutual respect to be reinstalled. In 1958, Nigeria struck oil as a young, soon-to-be-liberated country. The oil money was steady and hopes were high that Nigeria could prosper despite the brutal military regimes that marred that period. Being an oil-rich country, Nigeria had been enjoying the benefits of elevated oil prices during the 1970s. The golden decade had arrived and Nigeria became Africa's wealthiest, securing its title as the African giant. By 1974, Nigeria's oil wells were spitting out some 2.3 million barrels a day. With this oil boom came a growth in job opportunities, especially in the services and construction sectors. The general standard of living in Nigeria improved. During this period, there was an influx of people from the farms into the cities, and this influx came not just from within Nigeria, but from across the region of West Africa. While Nigeria was booming, its closest English-speaking neighbor Ghana was going through quite the opposite. A deadly mix of famine and insurgency was precipitated by a crash in the price of cocoa. Ghana was the world's largest cocoa producer in the 1960s. After the coup which ousted independence leader Kwame Nkrumah in 1966, Ghanaian politics became marked by a succession of military coups and fragile political regimes. This was all while Ghana's GDP experienced a substantial fall from the 1970s to 1983, at which point the country was bankrupt. Ghana's currency became worthless and its economy was in ruins. The factories in Ghana were operating at around 20% capacity, crippled by inadequate spare parts supply and raw materials. A series of military and civilian governments promised solutions, but nothing bore fruit. By the late 1970s, smuggling and profiteering had become so rampant in Ghana that few people were immune from accusations of corruption. With the rise in oil revenues, recruiters from Nigeria came to Ghana looking for people who would like to teach or take up casual jobs, the jobs Nigerians themselves were unwilling to do. The notable increase in job opportunities in Nigeria, as well as the existing similarities between the Ghanaian and Nigerian administrative systems, appealed to Ghanaians, prompting their relocation to Nigeria in search of better lives. Upon relocating to Nigeria, the Ghanaians worked in different industries as laborers, traders, artisans, teachers, architects, lawyers, and doctors. So many Ghanaians went to Nigeria that it seemed like every Ghanaian family had a relative working there. Indeed, law offices, shoe repair shops, ice cream parlors, restaurants and brothels were flooded with Nigeria's neighbors from the west. Many of these Ghanaians who made the journey east are believed to have entered Nigeria under a protocol of the Economic Community of West African States which allowed citizens from member countries to enter Nigeria without visas for 90 days. It's also worth pointing out that a high number of migrants also entered Nigeria without valid papers, often with the cooperation of immigration officials. Many of those who entered legally overstayed the 90 days permitted by the protocol without applying for or securing an extension. At the time, Nigeria was under the leadership of President Shehu Shagari. President Shagari assumed office after elections in 1979 after the military government led by General Olusegun Obasanjo handed over power. This whole time, Nigeria and Ghana had maintained a mostly cordial diplomatic relationship. That is until when the government of Hila Liman, a good friend of Shehu Shagari, was overthrown by Fight Lieutenant Jerry J. Rawlings. In this instance, with Ghana facing disastrous conditions, Flight Lieutenant Jerry J. Rawlings initiated his coup on December 31, 1981, an event known throughout Ghana as Rawlings' second coming. Rawlings noted soon after the coup that Ghana had hit rock bottom. 
This second coming of Jerry Rawlings drastically affected Nigeria's foreign policy towards Ghana. The Shagari administration was not prepared to give a categorical recognition of the Rawlings administration. This stance is understood when viewed from the 13 years of military rule that preceded the Shagari administration in Nigeria. Of additional significance was the fact that Jerry Rawlings himself had demonstrated his displeasure for the Shagari-led Nigerian government, accusing it of corruption. Rawlings and Shagari were not on great terms, and this situation deteriorated to the extent that, by 1982, Nigeria even stopped shipping crude oil on loan to Ghana after Rawlings claimed that Shagari was conniving to assist Hila Liman to overthrow him. Around this period, Jerry Rawlings had been increasingly on guard. Between 1982 and 1983, there were several coup attempts against him made by dissatisfied parts of the army. The economic success which befell Nigeria was short-lived due to the plummeting of oil prices in 1982. By 1983, the price of a barrel had fallen to $29, down from $37 in 1980. Unsurprisingly, Nigeria, whose economy was almost exclusively reliant on oil, was hard hit. By 1982, 90% of Nigeria's foreign reserves had been wiped out. Nigeria also began hurting from austerity measures that had been imposed in the hope of stabilizing the economy. Urban employment fell drastically and food shortages became severe. Salaries became erratic. Now, with the impending presidential election of August 1983, Nigerian politicians were determined to scapegoat immigrants in an attempt to mask other overpowering causes of Nigeria's economic failure, including the mismanagement of oil revenue, corruption, as well as high volumes of short-term debt and the infamous Cement Armada scheme. The politicians in Nigeria started to use words like aliens in their manifestos in preparation for the 1983 general elections. They blamed African migrants, especially Ghanaians, for the flailing economy. The rhetoric from the Nigerian politicians was that the Ghanaians had taken all the jobs and brought crime to Nigeria, and if elected, they would chase them out. The fact that a religious riot in Kano in December 1980, in which more than 4,000 civilians were killed, was led by a Cameroonian and that 20% of the people who participated in this riot were foreign nationals created the widespread impression among many Nigerians that it was illegal immigrants who were behind the basic threat to security in Nigeria. This situation in Nigeria escalated further with the robbery incident at Alex Ekweme's house in Ikoi, Lagos. Alex Ekweme, the then Nigerian vice president, was robbed by a group of armed robbers which consisted mainly of immigrants. When the robbers were caught by the police, it was discovered that two of them were Ghanaians. This revelation sent the whole of Nigeria in rage. On 17 January 1983, Alaji Ali Baba, the then Nigerian Federal Minister of Internal Affairs, in a television broadcast ordered all unskilled foreigners residing and working illegally to leave Nigeria by 31 January 1983. Skilled persons were allowed to stay up to 28 February 1983. In his message, the minister added that, from 31 January of that year, security agents would inspect commercial and industrial establishments as well as households to identify defaulting aliens as were the foreigners called and that those found contravening the order would be repatriated and their names put on a stop list to ensure that they did not return to Nigeria. It was further announced that registration of legal aliens would begin on 14 February 1983 at the immigration headquarters in all the 19 states and Abuja. Minister Awhaji Alibaba warned that all companies who were found to be illegally employing aliens would be severely dealt with under the immigration laws. Employees of federal, state and parastatals as well as citizens of Cameroon and Chad who had come to Nigeria before 1963 were however excluded from the expulsion order irrespective of what they did. Some of the major reasons cited by the Nigerian government for the expulsion of the illegal immigrants included ensuring the integrity of Nigerian immigration laws as well as the general economic recession which resulted in the reduction of foreign exchange earnings to Nigeria since 1981. 
Other reasons given were the involvement of some foreign nationals from neighboring countries in violent religious disturbances in Nigeria and the involvement of some Ghanaians in some crimes, including armed robbery. Interestingly, the expulsion of Ghanaians from Nigeria could be considered as a punch in the face of the Ghanaian government in retaliation for expelling Nigerian immigrants in 1969. In November that year, Kofi Busia, the then Prime Minister of Ghana, invoked the Aliens Compliance Order in which all foreigners in Ghana were required to have residence permit and if they did not have it, obtain it within a two-week period. To this end, Kofi Busia expelled hundreds of thousands of Nigerians from Ghana in about three months. Most of the illegal immigrants started the process of leaving Nigeria. In the process of their displacement, Nigerian police physically harmed them, beating and gassing some of them in the hope that they would depart immediately. For this unplanned journey, the immigrants used the most readily available bag that could carry the most part of their luggage. This particular bag was a strong checkered bag and it was from this ordeal that the bag got its name, which is still used to this very day, Ghana must go. The Ghanaians departed Nigeria into neighboring Benin Republic through the Seme border. Thousands of people also massed at the port in Lagos waiting for boats and others were caught in Benin and Togo as they waited to cross into Ghana. About 1,000 people a day were reportedly leaving on special flights to Ghana, but most of the evacuees were too poor to afford the $150 fare. Dozens were loaded into open haulage trucks headed for Ghana. It would be a huge understatement to say that the borders were a disaster, crammed with desperate people carrying chairs on their heads, dragging their checkered bags and selling off whatever they couldn't lift to make money to pay for fares that had doubled. What further contributed to the chaos at the border was that prior to this, Jerry Rawlings, Ghana's military head of state, had ordered the closure of Ghana's borders with Togo to desist coup plotters and insurgents, who had tried to take power from him countless times. The closure of these borders meant that there would be no passage for days for these immigrants that were leaving Nigeria. And so, as these illegal immigrants were leaving Nigeria, headed for Ghana, Togo closed its border with Benin to avoid a refugee crisis. Cars towed bumper to bumper from the Benin-Togo border to Lagos with people caught in sweltering heat and without water. Diseases spread. However, after some time, Jerry Rawlings eventually opened the Ghana-Togo borders, which then prompted Togo to also reopen its borders with Benin and allow the refugees to cross the countries, eventually getting back to their homeland. Though most critics did not dispute Nigeria's sovereign right to enforce its immigration laws, they argued, however, that this expulsion came too sudden. In many circles, it was largely insinuated that major departments of the Nigerian government were left unaware of the order. It is widely believed that Nigeria's Ministry of External Affairs first heard about the order on television. The Nigerian police force came across this order in the newspapers and almost one week after the go-home order, the police were yet to receive a directive from the federal government on its enforcement. As I alluded to earlier, the expulsion was seen as an attempt to divert the attention of Nigerians from the economic woes the country was facing and the corruption charges against the Shagari regime. This decision by the Nigerian government was not just widely criticized but was also strongly condemned by many countries of the world. The act was denounced as being contrary to the spirit of African hospitality and various international agreements. In all, the 1983 expulsion soiled Nigeria-Ghana diplomatic relations. President Sheo Shagari eventually won the 1983 elections. Unfortunately for him, on December 31, 1983, he was toppled in a coup d'etat by Major General Muhammadu Buhari. As for Ghana, the country's economy suffered some more before a steep climb up after interventions from the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Don't forget to like and share the video if you enjoyed it. Thank you all for tuning in. This has been Tatenda for African Biographics. Wishing you a happy 2024. Until next time, cheers. Have a good one.